Good afternoon, everyone. A uh, warm welcome on behalf of uh, Dhaka Golf Lab, the third edition. Uh, we have a very special uh, honorable delegate here, uh, Mr. Hans Robert Eisenhower from Germany. Uh, please a warm welcome, Mr. Hans. Uh, Mr. Hans, as you all know, he attended our earlier edition, the second Dhaka Golf Lab, for the first time. And uh, as you all uh, remember, uh, Mr. Nilotpal Majundar uh, reminded us that he had been his, you know, producing gurus, one of the producing gurus that uh, he admires really. And Mr. Hans, as you have already, uh, many of you have seen uh, from the you know, printed brochure that Mr. Hans has been uh, engaged in production, uh, producing film, producing since long. Uh, it's the 1991 since he joined the RD, the famous uh, film production company, and had a long career over there till 2011. And uh, he joined later on in um, Fanta, Fantana, I think, right? Fantana Films, yeah. uh, Germany. Uh, he moved to Berlin and he started working with Fantana Films. And uh, he had been actually very, uh, uh, very much engaged with, you know, co-productions, film productions uh, for the production companies globally and uh, uh, has a very, you know, unique experience of uh, co-production -co film market. Actually, he has initiated uh, one of the uh, Syrian filmmakers' film uh, jointly with German uh, Syrian co-production, that is. Mr. Talal's uh, films that have won a lot of uh, awards from different international film festivals like the Cannes, uh, the Sundance, and many others. And it for, of course, yeah. So we are very lucky to have him here uh, among us. And Mr. Hans would be basically, we were requesting him to uh, discuss, put a little more light on, you know, film producing, which has been a uh, kind of a new, you know, activity in our region, uh, comparatively uh, than the European or you know other Western communities. We have very uh, less uh, you know experience regarding uh, international film productions, as well as the filmmakers that you all know or you are here. That we are also uh, a little interacted with the you know global film market where we are supposed to you know teach our projects or apply for, you know, co-productions and so on. So I request uh, Mr. Hans uh, to put some light on, you know, what film producing is basically. And we can start with actually what is a, a, good, a documentary film basically that you consider. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what you read here is not the first question. Some filmmakers are already, uh, after beginning developing a story, uh, talking about money and uh, this is wrong. This is the last question because uh, filmmaking starts much earlier and uh, I think, uh, just a second, I have to take that out. Um, no, it's, uh, you know, film, the documentary uh, filmmaking in this world is uh, more and more complicated uh, because there are uh, very, very many different um, uh, stories around. There are many different uh, commissioning editors, TV stations, funding stations, but uh, it is always needed for producers and for uh, filmmakers uh, to find uh, this, uh, this uh, funding for their story. Uh, but what is the first thing what one should do uh, to become a very, very good film? For me, a documentary film is a story at first. The development of a story, this is a very first thing. I know some uh, people who think uh, that they just Google and they go to the internet, they find something interesting, a subject, and then they, they, they think this is already the basic thing for a film. I don't agree. I think uh, a film needs to be developed. 
A film needs to be researched, a profound research um, on the ground with the people, with the characters uh, in the film. And uh, film, documentary filmmaking is all about storytelling. Storytelling, a narrative which goes from the beginning until the end, which has, a, a, let's say, um, a conflict in between and which could be interesting uh, for a larger audience, um, sometimes only regional or national, but uh, also international and worldwide. And uh, I think uh, documentaries are nowadays more important than ever. Maybe, yeah, maybe this is, this is exaggerated, but if you have a look on the world like it is, um, and if you have a look on what's going on in the so-called social media on YouTube, if you have a look what's going on in television everywhere, documentary filmmaking is something different. Documentary filmmaking means telling stories. And uh, it's much, much, it goes much deeper than, than for example, a news, uh, news program, a reportage or something like that. Uh, take an example, we are in Bangladesh and uh, every year there is a huge flood going on and we see it in Europe, in the television, we see the people suffering, um, but we see it from outside. We have no idea what is going on uh, in these communities with these people, how they uh, survive uh, this uh, sometimes horrible uh, situation. This is something which documentary filmmaking can tell us. It, it can tell us the background. It can give us uh, more deep knowledge about what's going on in the world. Um, or uh, take another example. Uh, if you have, um, and this is one of the projects here, um, uh, this uh, story about uh, a factory which burned, uh, which had an, uh, which burned down, and uh, the victims died, and uh, mother tries to find um, uh, find uh, justice uh, and accuses uh, the owners and so on. So what what we where we don't know what we where, where it comes from, uh, under which condition it has been made. We, we see short reportage somewhere, we read an article, but we don't know exactly how uh, these people who are working in these factories live, how they can survive. And this is necessary to know um, before we buy something, for example. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very sure that documentary filmmaking has a, a place, a major role in, uh, in the struggle for human rights. And um, if, you, if, if you take um, also the, the, the subject climate change, everybody is discussing it and uh, everywhere you find something in the news. Uh, but what are the stories of those people who are going to lose their island in the Pacific Ocean or something? What is uh, directly uh, happening with uh, people in Italy or somewhere else where huge floods and thunderstorms destroy uh, their villages and, and things like that. So I think this is something which documentary filmmaking can, can deliver. It can uh, open the eyes, it can make your thinking it can initiate a debate about uh, what's going on in the world and it is a best, uh, the best weapon against so-called fake news, uh, the lies in politics or society or e economy uh, to find out what is really behind, what is behind the curtain, where is the corruption in a society, who are the, the criminal guys who are who have the profit on, on this and brave, brave, really brave documentary filmmakers, they show this, they give us the opportunity and you too give us the opportunity to have a look behind, uh, behind the curtain. And uh, this is for me the basic thing 
of uh, documentary filmmaking, to have an idea, then to develop this idea, to research this idea, and then to create a story, to find characters, to find a conflict, and then you can tell a story. And it doesn't matter in which uh, genre it is, it is history, it is uh, uh, contemporary, uh, is it current affairs or is it arts, for example, it's the same thing. Always the same thing. You need a, a, um, a fascinating story uh, to tell, to be told, uh, to get your audience and to have a communication with the audience at the end. Well, in this point, I would like just like to ask you uh, one more, you know, relative questions. That is, uh, sometimes our regional filmmakers, I'm I'm considering the split, the Southeast Asian region, and so on, including Bangladesh. Like we are newer, kind of comparatively newer to uh, you know approaching for funding to different international platforms and uh, filmmaking producing companies. So in, in applying in these com conditions, we have found like uh, uh, if uh, these organizations, as just as you have mentioned, that they are uh, behind you know important events or conditions that are taking place in that particular region, maybe the flood or you know turmoil in people's life or you know whatever uh, some difficulties people are being through, like the. Uh, the recent uh, cases of the Rohingya, you know, uh, you know, intervention in the region, like they have to flee here to save their life. But uh, at the same time, we find like applying with these subjects or something a more deeper introspection toward you know human suffering or human condition. While dealing with these subjects, we have found like the international you know, funding organizations are more interested toward uh, very focused issues like uh, very discussed and like very uh, you know high, highly uh, speaking spoken issues so uh, uh, apparently from there that situation how do you consider like a filmmaker with its own artistic and you know personal approach towards cinema could also apply toward this, uh, medium toward this, you know, funding situations, producing. I mean, uh, I mean, we should later talk about maybe about co-productions and what what means co-production and what are the advantages and the disadvantages. But uh, if you, it is true that a lot of commissioning editors and uh, also the platform owners and so they are not sometimes not very keen to have typical um, regional or uh, local stories. I heard it very often that the commissioning editor said, oh, okay, this story is very local. It should be shown uh, in the television of the region or everywhere, but it's not for an international audience. I think uh, in many cases, I personally disagree because I'm convinced that also a story is based in a region or even local. It can be so fascinating that it could be interesting for a worldwide audience. It can be universal. If it tells a human story, if it tells a story, a drama of human beings, of people uh, who, who are in, in, in relationship, and if it's told in a way that uh, people of another culture are able to understand what is going on there. Take this, I, I, sorry that I, I just take some also already from, from the catalog. I have read, I've read uh, about this uh, school teacher of a madrasa in, uh, in uh, Yes, and, and she educates uh, girls, girls and, uh, who should avoid being married too early. This is a huge issue. This is a huge human rights issue. 
and uh, the conflict with the traditional and uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamists in this case, because the girls are able to dance, to sing, and so on. This is something which is interesting for the rest of the world. So, uh, he also, it is based in one school uh, in a in a raw, uh, remote uh, area, um, and and so on. So, I I could mention a, a lot of examples uh, that could be interesting for uh, a larger audience. What I would like to show you now, maybe, I should start with uh, showing something. Um, I, uh, with, with my company, I'm doing for the time being um, a co-production with two Georgian filmmakers. Georgia is uh, traditionally a country with a huge uh, tradi cinema uh, tradition. And uh, these two filmmakers, they filmed uh, during the last seven or eight years uh, in a little village in the Caucasus Mountains where this so-called uh, new, um, uh, what is it, uh, Seidenstraße, the, the, how do you call that in English? The, the, the Chinese are creating this, uh, this railroad from China to, uh, to Europe. Silk How is it called in, 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 in English? Ah, Silk Road, sorry. Silk yeah, the new so called New Silk Road. And this railroad, railway, is going through their uh, village or through their valley. And the film is focused on, on their life there. What is changing with that? What are uh, changing for themselves, for the house owners, for the people? Uh, and what is changing for, uh, for example, for the nature. And I should show you, it's just a rough cut. It's not, not really finished yet. Uh, we hope that we can present it at IFA in November. Um, and it's a co-production between Georgia and uh, Germany, my company. And uh, we are doing it for the European Culture General Art and for a couple of others. Um, maybe you are interested that you watch a couple of minutes. It begins very dark, but then it... And the people haven't been informed what's going on there. Uh, they have been very surprised that suddenly everything is changing and uh, this film starts very, very slowly and uh, then it becomes uh, quite dramatic because of uh, the conflict uh, between the locals and uh, the Chinese workers, but also with uh, officials from the government. And uh, the nature changes because uh, there are some um, changes in the nature and some uh, rockets are going down into the village, houses are destroyed and everything. What I want to say is, this is an example from my point of view, that a story is a very, in the beginning, local or regional story with a few of people. One of the characters is this guy in the beginning, the, uh, the station manager of the station. And, uh, and then suddenly it becomes a relevance because it's an example which you could tell all along the way of the Silk Road, the new Silk Road, where uh, states um, are collaborating, working with uh, China and uh, they get money from China and they get more and more economically depending from, from this. And uh, so, and the people and the governments are saying, we have, uh, you have a lot of profit, jobs and everything, but finally uh, the people pay for that at the end of the day. So this is one example I would like to... And uh, I would also like to add in a uh, uh, click that, uh, 
the aesthetic quality of the you know tradition of cinema is absolutely there like the subtlety and the you know the mentality of life and like the lensing and other things that is being very interestingly been taken care of so uh, it is it is not it is not a film which is actually made uh, for television it's a film uh, which is made for for cinema and for um, for um, uh, festivals on the other hand i always in my whole uh, professional life i uh, try to take uh, films uh, to the screen which have exactly this cinematic qualities because uh, I actually I don't like this um, kind of contradiction between television and uh, and uh, cinema. A lot of unfortunately, a lot of commissioning editors and TV responsibles uh, they are very fast in their judgment, saying, "Okay, this is uh, too slow. This is not for cinema. If the second scene is coming, the audience has been already vanished." Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I trust that uh, more and more people uh, want to see also this kind of films, not only um, uh, in cinema and the streaming platforms. They are they are showing this kind of films, and the people are uh, buying uh, the uh, abonnements and and they watch this kind of films on the streaming platforms. Because television less and less is going to show them, and also um, you know the uh, so by that way we can also understand that what would be the uh, you know prerequisite for a filmmaker to you know apply to work with you know fundings and all because he must be possessing and considering his story about communicating it to the other part of the condition. So, how do you, uh, you know, just figure out a few by a few points maybe that what are the, you know, prerequisites that a filmmaker must possess? Yeah, I, I, I think um, it is very important uh, that uh, you find partners. Uh, it, there are only a few examples that um, films coming from. Uh, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and so on, which go immediately uh, to European television without uh, being a co-production. Uh, because the television uh, responsibles, the controllers, and all, all these people, they want to have, uh, so to say, somebody in between who represents, in a way, uh, their their culture. One can find that okay. Uh, I find it in a way critical, but on the other hand, uh, it is good uh, because of the financing at the end of the day. Because um, if you want to finance a film uh, which uh, like this, uh, you ha we have already seen it was funded by partly by the Georgian uh, cultural minister, uh, then a small George and other fund and so, and uh, that was not enough to do it. So the filmmakers, they spend a lot of money from their own money and uh, to, to do this filming over a period of time of seven years or even eight. And then we came together and uh, I could raise uh, in Germany and in Arte, uh, uh, quite a lot of money, uh, and they agreed to do it, um, which is not normal. I mean, it is really some, it's an exceptional thing. Um, and we could finance finally the film and we can finish it now. Otherwise, it would have taken another year or, or more to go to other fundings, to Sundance, to uh, um, ITFA, uh, it, it was also ITFA Berta Fund, by the way. I mean, most of you, they know ITFA Berta Fund, uh, which is a very, very important uh, fund for uh, this kind of uh, films at the end of the day. Um, I personally think um, 
that co-productions, if you can avoid to do co-productions, then you should do it, but mostly you cannot avoid it because otherwise you cannot finance uh, your film. It has advantages, it has also disadvantages. Um, a disadvantage is that in some cases, if a co-producer comes in with a lot of funding, then he tries to change the story or he tries to take over uh, the majority of the film and so on and then you are in a situation that you are going to lose your, your total copyright and the total control of your film. Um, and uh, this is sometimes not good. Uh, one of the examples, uh, one of the most prominent examples was the film Sugar Man. I don't know if you know it. Sugar Man was a film about a musician. It was originally the idea of a Swedish uh, filmmaker and it was a film about six, seven hundred thousand euros or something. And suddenly, because of the music, because of, uh, of the interesting story, um, a British-American uh, producer took over, uh, raised a lot of uh, money in America, and finally it was an American film, and uh, a British-American film, and it won the Oscar. Uh, so that is, that is sometimes difficult, and uh, the director more or less lost uh, the control of this. So, uh, parallelly, I would like to ask you uh, that uh, whether the, these are uh, kind of films that you have mentioned, uh, these are a little bit bigger uh, co-production films by budget size and all, but what did you uh, think about like uh, for doing smaller, comparatively smaller independent film projects, do you have also some scopes for you know, applying to medium range of funds and all this also? And uh, uh, in those cases, the design of the proposal, whether they would also matter, like uh, in consideration for the funding. I mean, I mean, uh, now we are starting. <laughs> we are talking again, <laughs> talking directly about money. I try to avoid that. Uh, in a way, money, no, no, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> funding is a very important thing, but. Content, story, uh, and these things, they are much, much more important in the beginning. And therefore, this kind of workshop is so, so necessary to, to be done. And, and we need this kind of meeting points uh, to, to network, to meet people, and to, uh, to find uh, the money uh, somewhere else. And uh, I can give you another example uh, of a film which has been in the beginning, a very, very little, tiny story, and uh, it became finally a film which has been nominated for an Oscar. It started all um, in, uh, in the Palestinian uh, West Bank, um, uh, and uh, a young family father he was uh, frustrated about the occupation by the Israelis and he started uh, filming how they behaved and how they treated the people and over a period of time of uh, about six, seven years, he filmed uh, every day or every second day what was happening he had at the end a huge amount of uh, material and he had five broken cameras because each camera has been destroyed during his filming by the Israeli army. And uh, so he came with this huge amount of material to a workshop like this. And uh, we discussed with him uh, the story and tried to uh, find a way through all this material to have at the end a fascinating story. Um, then it happened that uh, at the pitching, which takes place tomorrow, one of the uh, guests from France, he um, articulated interest 
and uh, he uh, took over uh, with uh, with uh, the Palestinian uh, guy, and they found a director. And that's interesting. They found a director because the, the filmmaker was not a director; he was just a cameraman. And they needed somebody who has uh, had the skills to make a film. Uh, was an Israeli, and it, it was suddenly a fantastic uh, Palestinian Israeli French international co-production, starting in a tiny little village in a in a uh, let's say. A lemon tree yard or something. I should I just show you two minutes of the train. at IFA and uh, premiered at IFA and then it was in in uh, Los Angeles um, and worldwide uh, acknowledged in a lot of festivals. So I think uh, this is another example when a story started in a in a very local area and this is the same for you if you have a, a a strong story, the most important thing is a strong story and a very, uh, very good characters and compelling uh, conflict and uh, things. For me, the key, the two keys, the three keys of a film, of a good story, that is first, access, second, research, and the third is a good camera, um, good images, because this is always also something which is uh, necessary. And then, if you have a strong story, and if you have a, a characters who can carry the, the carry out the conflict and co who stand for something, um, then it is possible to go international. Also. If your story is a, a small one. On the other hand, um, if there is a link, for example, like uh, in uh, many, many films, they have a link to Europe that the filmmaker has filmed not only here but also in Europe. So uh, there are possibilities to find uh, 
interest. On the other hand, I have to say, unfortunately, nowadays our television uh, stations in Europe, and not only in Europe, I think worldwide, they focus more and more on uh, local stories, ignoring their, their potential, uh, but local stories as their own stories. Um, I give you another example. Um, maybe how much time we have? We have time? Okay. I give you another example. Um, when uh, let's let's take a, a film about somebody who has uh, a subject like cancer or subject like uh, uh, robbery or whatever, uh, people, commissioners would say, okay, we have that in our region also and we already showed something about it, so we don't need your film uh, anymore. Also, it's much more, much, much better maybe and much more fascinating and, and so on. Uh, so I would like to, to show you something which has been a film, which a story and a film, which has been pitched uh, two years ago in uh, Kolkata. And uh, it uh, is a film about a, a team of uh, palliative care uh, people in Delhi who are um, going around and helping um, sick people, uh, cancer, uh, people, can, uh, people with a cancer uh, to not to survive, but to, to take uh, what, what happened to them and to, to give them a way uh, to be calm and not to suffer too much. This is a very, very strong subject. And immediately everyone says, oh no, that's too dark. That something has to do with death or that's not, not uh, for me. When it was pitched, the reaction was quite uh, divided. Some liked it because of uh, the cinematography and others said, uh, no, it is black and white, and that uh, doesn't work for our audiences in television. And others uh, said, uh, yeah, uh, you know, we have these palliative care teams also in our country, and we don't uh, need something coming from India. Anyway, the film um, became a co-production, and uh, it could be financed uh, by international money, but also partly a little part from India. And uh, now it's uh, close to be ready. And uh, it is, uh, it will hopefully also have its premiere in, uh, in Amsterdam. I would like to show you um, a couple of minutes of this film and when I saw it the first time I saw a lot of material and I saw the first rough cut, the second rough cut and I realized that this will become a masterpiece um, and a very very good example of a cooperation between an Indian filmmaker and uh, European um, co cooperation, so to say. So all in all, these are uh, there are three three cases. Uh, they go throughout the film, and uh, the patients at the end uh, they die. Only one has maybe a chance at the end. Um, but I, I always said it's not a film about death. It's a, a film about life. It's a 
it's a, it's a film about the end of the life and uh, and it's more a film about also the 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 people around the relatives and uh, the palliative care team which is fascinating how close they are <coughs> going to these patients so this film is universal this is something which happens everywhere and uh, and it's additionally um, a film which shows how necessary it would be and it is in countries like India or Bangladesh uh, to improve the situation um, of uh, palliative care. In Europe or in America everything is in a way fine, you know, but he here it's relative uh, rare that uh, people care like these people we have just seen. I, I mean, I this is something which, which creates a discussion, which creates uh, really um, thinking. People think about their own situation, their own life. And this is a power of documentary filmmaking, uh, from my point of view. Um, two days ago, I was uh, in Berlin in a, in a screening. Uh, it was a huge presentation of a Canadian, American, no, Canadian, European, a co-production about um, propaganda and fake news and so on. It was a collection of all these things which happened within the last couple of years. There was no emotion, there was no fascination. After the film I forgot two-thirds of what I have seen. And if you watch a film like this, or also the other one, then you remember the images, you remember what you have seen, and this is in your, in your mind and in your head. And this is something you have to create as filmmakers. You have to create um, in, in people's minds memory. And, uh, and I used to say um, films and documentary films, they are very, very important part of our audiovisual heritage in this world. And uh, that's uh, all about documentary filmmaking. Um, yeah, let's talk about money. No, <laughs> no. I would like I would like uh, to to say um, it. It doesn't make sense that I now uh, tell you um, uh, different uh, ways of of uh, financing your films. I mean, it's so diverse. On one hand, you have public funding from different uh, countries, from cultural institutions, cultural ministers in a lot of uh, countries. Um, for example, this film, uh, Watch Over Me, was partly financed by public money coming from Switzerland. And uh, another money came from Itva Berta uh, Fund in Holland. This is for you one of the most important funding institutions, I would say. And for European co-productions, for co-productions with Europe, there is a special fund, which is called ITFA Berta Europe. Uh, in this case, you need a European co-producer and he can apply uh, and he can get maximum 40,000 uh, euros. This was the case in this Watch Over Me uh, film. And, uh, then another money came from, will, will come hopefully, toy, 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 from BBC and a couple of others. Um, and uh, then you have Sundance, uh, the Sundance Institute, you have Tribeca, uh, you have uh, funds like Chicken and Egg and a lot of different funding institutions worldwide. And... Uh, this, and then you have uh, also the possibility uh, to bring your film on, on streaming uh, platforms and uh, everybody is talking for the time being about Netflix, um, but Netflix is only one and Netflix take only the blockbusters and the big things, but there are smaller, uh, smaller platforms where you uh, can, can publish uh, your film. Or at the end on YouTube and, and you, it, is, it is a large possibility to present your films. 
the problem is always the funding and the finding finding the money and uh, this depends from i can only repeat it from how strong your story is how relevant the subject is and what can it tell to the rest of the world that is uh, the only secret of all of that i would say maybe i i mean i i what else shall we shall we i can show you other things if you don't mind um yes sure sure okay good So I, I, I could uh, I could show you um, a film which has been done uh, a couple of years ago, 2013. 2013 it was in Itfa, 2014 it was uh, in Sundance. It is a film which has been done by many people, many people who had tiny cameras and filmed uh, the beginning of the Syrian war uh, in Homs. I don't know if you have this uh, watched this film, Return to Homs, uh, which is a co-production uh, between uh, Germany, other countries in Europe, Canada, Japan, and uh, Arab, uh, different Arab uh, funds. And uh, it has been done by a young Syrian filmmaker. Meanwhile, he is not anymore so young, but uh, <laughs> he is meanwhile living in Berlin. And uh, we became friends. We worked on this uh, over two years on this film, over three years on this film. Um, it started with just an interview. That was the, the first thing, uh, the first I, one scene of interview um, I have watched uh, at Itfa in 2011. And I was fascinated by the character. And it shows an, ex it's an example how important the characters are. It's in a way, if you, one can say it's a character driven film at the end. Um, a young 19 year old, old boy, a uh, sportsman, he was a goalkeeper of uh, the young Iraq, uh, young Syrian uh, football uh, team. And uh, he was uh, one of the best players. And he was at the same time an activist and a singer. And he was one of the, in a way, the soul and the heart of the beginning of the uh, uh, resistance and, and uh, the demonstrations um, in, uh, in Homs. And this was the very first trailer uh, which uh, we had uh, to pitch it for the finance. And uh, because of this guy and his certain charisma and the subject of uh, the ongoing Syrian civil war, in the beginning it was a civil war, meanwhile it's a, it's a real international war, one can say, and uh, nobody knows, knew in the beginning what will happen. And uh, this, I said, was the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. And uh, the filmmaker Talal Derki, he filmed uh, until 2013, beginning of 2013. And in the film, you see how this beginning, in the beginning, conflict, riots, demonstrations become a incredibly brutal and uh, bloody uh, war at, at the end. And everything focused on, on this guy. One of the other guys, he was arrested and uh, killed by the Syrian uh, army. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's an example of a film which, which starts with a quite, yeah, local situation in a city 
and then it becomes um, not a metaphor, but it becomes a film about, about the whole Syrian war uh, focused on this on this uh, city. And uh, the camera work has been done by activists themselves, partly by the filmmaker also. He has been there two, three, four times. And the, the material was smuggled out. My co-producer was arrested on the border when he wanted to go to Jordan and then to Egypt. And he was um, in one of these army prisons. Fortunately, after a couple of weeks, he came out. And uh, it's Orban de Rabia, who is meanwhile the head, uh, creative head of ITFA in Amsterdam. And uh, so this is a film which, for me, has also a certain sustainability because it's a film about war and it shows how war is at the end and how it affects people and what does it make with people because in the beginning this guy was uh, just um, a sportsman and he was uh, liked uh, the life and, and singing and dancing and so on and in the end he was a, a very strong also quite close to fundamentalism um, soldier and uh, yeah and he made a career after that um, film he came out of uh, Homs then, and when Homs was occupied by the Assad regime for a short time he joined uh, another group of uh, rebels and uh, two or three months ago he was uh, killed uh, close to Idlib because he couldn't, he was in Turkey in exile, he even married and then he couldn't uh, stand, uh, he couldn't accept not anymore fighting against uh, this regime, he was completely traumatized and in the end, he was a couple of months ago killed. So, so yeah, maybe one final, one final example. Um, one final example. It's a story which is based. Uh, in Saudi Arabia and it's a film about women's rights in a way. You know that there have been some uh, changes in Saudi Arabia and uh, it's a very young filmmaker and uh, she wants to do this, uh, this film and she has made uh, quite good research in Saudi Arabia and uh, has found uh, some characters who are really able to carry the story and uh, it's in the beginning of finance with partly public money and partly um, uh, television money So we are almost at the end of the session and thanks to you of course like for giving us a vivid introspection about the, you know, the producing uh, job and uh, if uh, anyone likes to add something and if not we would like to end up the... So I think everyone has a clear <laughs> understanding from now onward about uh, What's happening in the production, production, producing condition, and like how the producers deal about you know subjects, and as we have learned um, through throughout the discussions, and uh, I'd like to thank, of course, Mr. Hans um, for your effort behind this presentation, and like 
that you have taken on the way for uh, arriving here and then for being in this wonderful uh, event also. And thank you very much, everyone, for your attention and attending this session. So, uh, if there is anything from your end to the end of time, it's yeah. Awesome. No, thank, thank you very much. I, I, would, I would say if you have concrete questions, we will have one-on-one -on -one meetings, I, I guess, after the, uh, the pitching, and then we can talk uh, more concrete and more detailed on what uh, I can answer your question as far as I can, and uh, I can try to give you an advice um, Finally, where to find uh, the money at the end of the day. Um, and um, yeah, I would say um, one thing is very important um, for, for you as filmmakers. Let me just, yeah. So when you have everything, when you have finished your, your workshop here and you had a successful um, Pitching, then it's not the ending. Uh, it's a beginning of a journey which can take long. Sometimes filmmakers need four or five years until they have financed their film. The filmmakers from Georgia, from the platform, they needed seven years to finance uh, their film. And finally, and they didn't lose anything of their patience and their power and their um, passion and therefore for me the sweet piece of a, of a, of a of good uh, strong producing is power passion and patience because all of these three things you need uh, to uh, make finally a successful film well thank you very much